Okay, and our next speaker is Philip Loche. Sorry if I butcher your name. Investigating electrostatic interactions with data-driven models. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thanks um, for the introduction and I'm really happy to be here. Um, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I would like to tell you what I've been working on in the group of Michele Ceriotti at EPFL on, on long range interactions. So for example, electrostatic interactions, which are eminent in water where you have electrolyte solutions, so you have long range interactions. And to start on, let's repeat a bit of um, how the electrostatic interactions work. So everything is based on Poisson's equation, right? As probably all of you have seen this equation. You can solve this equation by doing the Fourier transformation. Yeah, easily you get this K over two term here, which comes from the, um, the Laplace operator. And if you solve this equation, for example, for two two point charges, what you get in infinite medium that they um, depends inversely on the distance between those two ions, right? And you plot this, you get this long range one over RT, which is really long range by definition. Yeah, it never decays if you integrate over, over to zero. If we do simulations, we usually restrict ourselves to a simulation cell. So there is to avoid boundary or surface effects. So we have a simulation cell. So there is now a maximum distance between those two ions. After this, the interaction goes, goes down again. Even more, usually this is not enough. So what we have is we also have, if we, for example, consider a crystal, um, we have periodic images yeah, on one side. So if we would include the first image, there's an additional decrease in the coupling. Yeah, so then you have to sum over these two images on, on those two sides. So the third dimension is coming out of the, the screen here. And finally, we have an infinite um, stack of crystals. And what we then get is this purple line here. And actually, so what we see is there's a large um, contribution from the first image and the energy is up to a factor of two decreased um, compared to non periodic system. Yeah, and what I put in is, if you have crystals, the energy exactly when the ions have a certain geometry, it's called the Madelung constant, right? And exactly this Madelung constant um, was an interest some more about 100 years ago. People want to calculate these for several crystals. And there was one guy especially also interested in these things, um, this nice looking uh, German physicist over here. So um, he wants to calculate long range interactions by handling the short and the long range stuff contributions differently. And what he thought about is maybe let's split up this one of our R term in a short range term, which is zero after a certain cutoff and a one over term. So just a subtraction, which is slowly varying um, on the long range tail. And usually what you say is this F over R is the error function or the complementary error function here. If you solve this, what you get are three terms. And I would like to print out these terms here. So the first one is the real space term. Yeah, you see the error function over there and the charges and the distance, again, an infinite sum here. And you cut this off after a certain distance. Then you get a K space term. Yeah, there you again see the K square term, which comes from Poisson's equation and also the Fourier transform of a Gaussian because actually in a, in a simple picture, what you do is you put a Gaussian charge cloud on all your point charge, and this is how you do this construction. And then, of course, you get a, get a correction term. So the scaling, if we look at the scaling of this, um, this scales quadratically with the number of charges. You can treat this by optimizing like n to the three halves. Okay, now you could do simulations. You put a short range term like some Leonard Jones potential. Um, you can run simulation with point charges, but actually, um, can we also learn this long range effect in, in simulations? And so um, let's talk a bit about a data driven approach to this, not from a physical aspect, but from a data driven aspect. So, what I would like to learn is or to predict the energy of a certain distribution of atoms, what many of you, of you do. And I'm now using a really, really simple system, which is just sodium chloride random configurations. They have a max minimum distance of 2.5 angstroms. I just calculate the energy via this eval summation, and I now want to predict again this energy. Yeah, so the goal is actually, yeah, predict um, a certain structural representation with these, with these weights. And how do I get these weights? Um, let's do the most simple approach, just linear regression. Yeah, I was just no kernel models, no neural network, just linear regression. I want to learn these weights. Okay, I have a localization parameter. And then the goal is actually to construct a descriptor or construct a representation that maximizes my prediction accuracy 
and of course, on the other hand, my data efficiency, right? This is, this is always the goal. I can, of course, pump more and more data in as we saw, but actually I want to be as good in data efficiency and in prediction accuracy. So the first one, which we use a lot in our group, and I saw this on several screens, um, is an atom density representation, also called SOAP. So what you do is you have a general local atom density field. So what you do is you put on each atom a Gaussian charge cloud, um, and then you use an atom-centered representation, and you project this on an orthogonal radial basis. I will tell you what you could choose, and spherical harmonics, right? You probably know this from quantum mechanics. And then, of course, you can describe your system with four parameters. A is the species type, NLM. Uh, you could also say quantum numbers. Yeah, there are four numbers. And then, um, you usually use Gaussian type orbitals for this. Um, and so let's see how this um, behaves for our system. So what I'm using, I just use the radio basis. I just say, okay, my system, it's overall, it's spherical invariant. So I just use the radio base. I set the other terms to zero. And then I, and then I learn, try to learn my electrostatic energy. Yeah, these are these orange curves. You know, this is soap radius spectrum, just linear regression. If you see, if I increase my cutoff, I get an increase in the percentage of the RMSE, and I will just give you the equation of the RMSE. So this is this one, the predicted minor test energy divided by the variance of the training data. I also put here in, in blue, a simple distance metric. So you just count the nearest neighbors and you construct a representation from this, which performs even worse than SOAP. Yeah, we see we get down to roughly 20 or 30%. So it's only a bit better than, than just randomly guessing. And um, okay, I wrote the acceptable agreement, but there is a problem that electrostatic is a long range effect. So even if you increase your cutoff, increase your cutoff, increase your cutoff, you will never be able to learn this perfectly because you have this one over R uh, tail. How can, you, how can you solve this? Is there a way around? And um, what, what um, people came up with in, in the group said, okay, let's convolute this Gaussian with a one over R term where this, where we can also add several exponents. So exponent equal one would be for electrostatic. You could also put an exponent to the six if you have a system which is dominated by dispersion effects. So now, but I have to say, even this, it looks like, like I'm doing like a one over R fit to my system, this goes beyond like simple data learning where you just subtract the one over R tail because this is still a data-driven approach, right? I just construct with this my features and then I learn afterwards or I do regression afterwards with these features. Um, and let's look in a let's look in a scheme view. So this would be my, my Gaussian field. You saw this before. Now, if I convolute this with the one over R, you see there are these long, long-range tails. So even long-range. Um, atoms which are outside of my cutoff, they even contribute to my central atom here. I do a similar construction as, or a similar basis set as we use for the, for the SOAP features. So I project on a GTO-like basis. And if we look at this, this looks really similar to what we saw on the second or third slide. So this looks like a long range eval term, right? There's the one over K square term. There's again, the Gaussian term here and there are my spherical harmonics. So now we see there is the scaling term here. As we saw, this scales like quadratically in the charges. So which is actually a bit worse or an order of magnitude worse than what we have for SOAP. Um, so, but of course, what you could do is what, what we know how to do, what community knows to do. So you can improve this with grid based methods like PME. So it's known how this works, fast Fourier transformation. You can get this, this down to N log N. Um, and let's look how this how this how this works out here. Um, so we have um, now again our long distance equivalent here, and we see there is the low the red line, and we get orders of magnitude not close but close to machine precision. So we can really accurately describe the charge distribution of these systems. Um, so now, how would this now work for, for real for real systems? How would this, because this is a purely system which is purely dominated by, by, by long range effects. So um, the idea would be, I build for atoms inside my cutoff, I use the short range soap density. And for everything which is outside my cutoff, I construct features 
um, described by the long distance equivalent also, also loaded. This looks in pictures like this. Yeah, this would be my short range. And this would be my long range approach. And you see, this is really similar to what we saw in the EVAL convention. Yeah, you use a real space short range approach for everything which is within your cutoff, everything which is outside you handle in Fourier space. Um, and now people may want to try out. We also want to try to apply the series system. So the LAMPS interface we're currently um, developing. So we hope that we can do something um, soon. And um, I would now like to show you something. So we usually use the GTO basis. We like the GTO basis. It's really, it's really a general thing. But if for the long range tail, there's even a better approximation or a better way, which is even more data efficient. So you can show that there is for outside of the cutoff, you can represent these loaded features equally by using just a single radial basis, which we call the monomial basis. So you just have a single parameter in the end for electrostatic for other terms. And we have to work this out, which gains the speed up and the calculation in memory. And now we just um, look here at an even more simpler system because there we can work out interaction analytically. So just, just two ions in a periodic cell, and, and what we see here, so the monomial one is the blue one, which lies exactly under the green one, which is the GTO and factor A. So you get eight times less data you need for your learning, but you get exactly the same RMSE. Um, and with this, oh, I was really quick today. So um, I would like um, to summarize my talk. So I we accurately predict the energy of a charge distribution using the general data-driven um, approach, we take the long range effects into approach and for the future approaches, um, we will the combination of a short and a long range approach and these monomials are a promising candidate for long range features. And um, before we're done, since I have a lot of time, I would like to show you one application that we already did. So we trained simple molecules like um, with several distances, we um, looked at the binding curve, so polar, 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 apolar, 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 different types, so which are not like two electrostatic, which also has that dispersion relation. And this we can really explain with the V here stands for the loaded feature exponent to the one. So there it's not, as I thought, a real normal fitting, but really a data-driven approach. We can also explain other exponents with loaded features. And now I go back and Thanks for your attention and especially um, Michele Ciariotti for the work we did together and you for your attention. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, so please don't be shy. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so in, in this case, you know, you're motivated by Poisson's equations. Um, are there other general, like, can you generalize uh, different solutions to similar equations that would like imply uh, other bases that you should be adding to these types of things, not necessarily in a chemical setting, but like for generary, gen general function fitting over long ranges? Um, I mean, so if we go back to this equation here, So there is this exponent p term here, and you could put in any, any exponent. So you could put in one for electrostatic, p equals six to dispersion, which are physically the most relevant one, but you couldn't put any exponent. So the, the expansion coefficient, so the descriptor works for any exponent. So you could in principle put any interaction, but actually, as I showed you on the last slide, it's actually not so important. So you can get a little bit better efficiency, but actually, if you give me a general system, I have no idea what the dominant effect is. So in principle, I would just I would, we would just try different exponents and look what's the best exponent for a system, which also tells you what's the dominant interaction in your system. I guess, uh, I think what I mean is, uh, instead of starting off with Poisson's equation and yeah. arriving at this, like if you, like, for example, that's like the scalar version of the equation, but yeah. if you like generalize to higher tensor versions ah. of the equation, like, do you know what those functional forms look like? So, so okay, actually, so I use this as a motivation, but actually the derivation is not really connected to the Poisson's equation. So what we, we're not really learning dipolar or quadrupolar moments. It's really that we learn still on the structure. So the, 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 soap, the, the loaded model has no idea about charges. It's still a purely geometric assumption. So really what we learn in the end is still something which is like everything what we saw in SOAP. 
it's just a long range equivalent of this thing. So there is still the NLM feature and the atomic species. There's no, okay. no information about the charge. Okay, cool. Thanks. Any more questions? Going one. Oh, excellent. Since, since we will time. So you're saying there is no information about the charts, but maybe it goes back to the inductive bias of thinking, right? You're adding a one over R a yeah. feature that yeah. looks like the Coulomb interaction, yeah. right? Yeah. And then uh, I would even say more, you said it's, it was mono, so it was, the, the descriptor was just, it's monomial, yes. so it's just distance. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this it, it, it takes me a time to build an intuition about things. So how does this compare with putting point charges on everything else out there? Like. If, if I were to, like, how is this not analogous to putting a point charge on top of everything? Okay, so, so okay, I could also ask the question back, why do we use Gaussians for our short range features? I mean, they're nice behaved, right? Yeah, I don't know. Exactly. I mean, this also nicely behaves. I mean, you can solve, you can work this automatically. I mean, it just convolute the thing. I mean, you need something which is, you need something which is, which is long range. And the easiest long range is you just add a one over R function and just you work out what are actually the, the, the descriptor. I could put anything else in, but actually one over R works out. It's the, it's the straightforward assumption. And there is just an intuitive connection to the, to the one over R potential. But even though it's just a descriptor, which is motivated, which can explain us long range features. But also maybe my understanding, right? Like if this is, this is in some sense creating a local feature for me about my neighbors that are sort of far away yeah, with exactly. a one over R waiting or a- Yeah, exactly. So this is, I, I think the natural comparison with this would be try to learn point charges. I think you learn point charges, right? When, when you fit any- I mean, so, we learn we learn we we learn positions which are smeared out by by this one of our potential. I mean, also what what we do in soap is we replace the positions by these Gaussian charges. So, yeah, exactly what you learn you learn positions. I mean, this is what we all do. We learn we learn positions. Positions are points points in space, and we are not doing anything else here. We just replace these positions not by Gaussians or by distances, but we replace these by Gaussians folded with a one over R. So yeah, it, these are points, points in space. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's thank our speaker.